sometimes there's nothing better than being able to sit and chat to somebody on a similar level to you. Welcome to Island Influencers, where we share stories of successful business owners, experienced professionals, entrepreneurs and community leaders based or with influence in the Isle of Man. This podcast is brought to you by Thornton Chartered Financial Planners, because great financial planning has the power to change your life. Now here's your host, Chartered Financial Planner, Sharon Sutton. So welcome to this week's Island Influences and my guest this week is Jackie Bridson. Jackie took over the role of Chief Executive in March 2018 of the Isle of Man Live at Home schemes. Having spent her time growing up in Liverpool, she moved in 2005 to the Isle of Man, spending time here as a stay-at-home mum. But as uh, time progressed, she looked to make use of her professional skills as a trading standards officer and was appointed as a lay member of the Office of Fair Trading Statutory Board over nine years ago. She also spent six years as a member of the Ireland's Parole Committee. Jackie's mum to a teenager and a mad Vizsla dog called Biscuit. She loves to travel. She enjoys spending time, having new adventures. And her current hero is uh, Jürgen Klopp. Welcome to this week's episode of Island Influencers. Welcome, Thank you. Jackie Brideson, to Island Influencers. I'm really thrilled that you've come on as our guest today because we met we met a while ago. It's a while ago, um, and a lot has happened since. So um, yes, yeah. just a few things. Yeah. So well. For the benefit of our listeners, Jackie, uh, she represents the Live at Home charity and is also a board member of the Office of Fair Trading, which is um, it's a cause close to my heart, um, <laughs> given what we do. Um, so, I mean, let's let's kick off. Let's um, let's go back in time. Let's find out all, all about you, Jackie. Where, okay. where, where, where have you come from? What, uh, so what brought you here? I'm not a native to the Isle of Man. I came over in 2005, having lived in Liverpool for the majority of the life before that. Um, born and bred Liverpool, south end of Liverpool, which people often say to me, you don't sound that scouse. I am, and I can put it on. Uh, red or blue? I'm a red. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> to the detriment of the rest of my family, who are all blues. Oh, right. Oh. Yeah. So that was, um, yeah, that was a, a bone to cross all the time with my dad. Um, so, yeah, I lived in Liverpool, uh, grew up, went to a comprehensive school, uh, didn't do particularly well in my A levels because six one was quite a nice experience and we just enjoyed ourselves too much, which I think <laughs> is quite a common story. Oh, yes. um, plus, yes. I was growing up around the time of Derek Hatton and Margaret Thatcher, and right. that was quite a big thing in Liverpool at the time. The education system was stuffed a little bit with the way he dealt with Liverpool as a whole. Yeah. So um, came out, and my dad sort of said to me. Um, I'm not keen on you going to Polytechnic. He was a bit of a snob when it came to Red Brick Universities. But he said, if you go back and do your A-levels again at night school, but work in the meantime, then I'll be happy with that. So that's what I aim to do. Do it the hard way. I did. (laughs) And um, I started working doing sort of inputting into, he worked for Manweb, which was the electricity company, and he got Mm. me a job very nepotistic, got me a job putting data into a computer about um, people's bills and things. And in the meantime, I just kept scanning the the adverts for jobs. And um, a job came up to do training and qualifications within local government in Liverpool, uh, which I applied for, which is a trading standards job, which I'd never heard of. Um, and I think if you speak to most trading standards officers, we all fell into the profession. Yeah. And so I applied for it and got the job. But at the time, again, Liverpool Council was a bit of a, a mess and they were waiting for um, approval by the council that I would be appointed. So I think I waited about six months before I actually started. Um, but from then on, that was my career. That was mm. my profession. Right. So I did that from the age of 19 until I was about 36, 37. Gosh, that's a lot of experience, actually. It is. Yeah. yeah. And, from, and I was yeah. quite young, actually, um, in that career, because a lot of people tended to go in after they'd done degrees. Yeah. So when did trading standards kind of begin? Is it? I would, well, weights and measures yeah. was the main crux of trading standards years ago. So yeah. that's been going on since yeah, day, as, day as dot. But consumer protection, how uh, uh, it's more So some form. of the legislation would have gone back to the early 1900s, but, right. you know, sort of it developed and became, yeah. instead of, it started as 
concentrating on weights and measures and trading yeah. and then became more about consumer protection. Yeah. So although weights and measures was the main crux when I started the job, I mean, I used to go out and test weigh, weigh bridges and I used to climb on the top of um, tankers to dip tankers and yeah. did all that in the middle of winter at the docks in Liverpool. Oh, Went gosh. on the top of a coal beltway once, <laughs> got home and my mother just stuck me in the bath because I was just covered in coal dust. Right. Um, but... It, yeah, my, my forte became actually quite a lot consumer credit, if you believe yeah, that. No. So I did a lot of advice and guidance for people, particularly who'd signed up to credit deals that they didn't really understand. Yeah, so like debt counselling, really? It wasn't debt counselling, it was more, um, they didn't understand the thing they'd signed up to. So um, when they signed on the dotted line and they came back and they were like, oh, I didn't realise I'd have to pay that per month or I didn't realise that's how much I would pay at the end of it. So yeah, it was sure. sort of a bit yeah. of education and advice Gosh. as well. Yeah. Um, and I used to do a lot of advice on uh, to larger businesses about compliance and um, you know things like advertising and how they comply with legislation over there. Um, and sort of, I did my basic work so that they um, I got a good grounding in all areas. But I did specialise in fur trading um, and sort of got onto fur trading groups and started to lead. Um, sort of policy for the northwest in that area um, and then started to look to progress in the pro in the profession and take over management roles which I did and again I was um, probably one of the youngest chief trading standards officers in the northwest yeah, I, um, I took over that role about 31 32 right so I did that and my last role was in St Helens yeah okay and then you, at some point, you decided that you were going to come over to the no, island. No, I didn't no? decide that. <laughs> um, I've got a sister who's a lawyer who came over here to work. Right. And um, I came over on a girls' weekend. Right. Uh, went into a pub and met my husband. Gosh. Yeah, in oh, a pub yeah. in Douglas. Was he behind the bar or in front of the bar? He was in front of the bar. <laughs> he was. He's from here, he's Manx. Yeah. And um, he was actually living in Hampshire at the time. So we spent a little bit of time sort of to and fro between Liverpool and Hampshire. Um, yeah. But he had a property here. And he just said to me, I just want to go back. I want to go back to the island. And I think there's a law, isn't there, back to the island. A lot of people do tend to come back. I mean, apparently, I've never discovered the escape tunnel. Oh, have you <laughs> <laughs> so um, he decided to come back and said to me, do you want to come back with me? But he also said to me... Um, when he sort of decided to retire a little bit early and uh, he wanted to go um, travelling. So did I want to come travelling with him? So we went and we did four and a half months going around the world. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so, so where did you go? So we started off in Argentina. Then we went across to Chile. Yeah. Then we did New Zealand, Australia, Hong Kong and came home. Goodness but gracious. we didn't know each other that well at the time. I think right. I'd only known him about eight months. So you decided to quit your job and go travel yeah. around the world on the basis of somebody you knew a bit. Yeah. And, then, yeah. Yeah. and then we spent weeks in the camper van where we really got to know each other. Oh, yeah. Well. And um, <laughs> that was sort of the deciding point of whether, yeah, I actually quite like this bloke or... Yeah. I don't know what I would have done if I decided I didn't because I'd have had to get myself home. But um, So we did a bit of um, travelling between in camper vans and sort of but in some of the places we went to, some of the five-star hotels were really cheap. Um, so we managed to do a, a little bit of both. A bit of luxury as well. A little as a bit, bit of, of luxury as well. Yeah. yeah. So we did that and then came back and back on the island. Gosh, that, that was about 2005, was it? Um, it was about probably a little bit before then. Yeah. Um, and then moved properly over on 2005. And yeah. then 2007 had my daughter and we right. decided to settle properly yeah. here. Mm -hmm. We'd sort of been travelling between here and France. Yeah. So we stayed fully. Right. Um, and then Andy decided to go back to work. Uh -huh. So you have a 13-year-old girl? I've got a 13-year-old girl. Oh, I have a 13-year-old boy. That's interesting, isn't <laughs> yes, it? Yes, it is. <laughs> She's actually really good. Yeah. yeah. The, the, we, we attended the uh, lower five parents' um, reception last night. And we were warned by the, uh, the, the head of the house that... You know that sketch that you've seen about Harry Enfield where it's Kevin true. becomes Perry? Yeah, apparently so. I definitely think it's boys more than girls, though. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we've still got this bouncy teenager, so I'm, I'm, no, I'm all right. Just, yeah. <laughs> no, we, we've, got option, we've got options meeting on Tuesday. Gosh, already? Yeah, Blimey. because they've got to decide on their options for the year. And that sort of takes you back, way back, doesn't it? That so does. when you had to choose yeah, your own yeah. options. Yes. It's really difficult to advise as well as what to take yeah. because... 
you sort of she just, she's no idea what she wants to do well is it academic or is it vocational and what sort of person are you yeah and, yeah. I, and do you know at 13 anyway and, and on most of the jobs that are going to be there have they been created yet Who yeah. knows? and with the digital world how is mm. everything going to change anyway yeah be interesting yeah interesting time definitely right well good luck with that thanks <laughs> <laughs> so how did you um i've seen you've done you've got involved in quite a few things since you've been here there because you've you've Got, got involved in the Laxian and Lonnan live at home scheme quite early on, didn't yeah, you? Yeah. So I um, became stay at home mum for a few years, and um, which was fine. Mm. But I did find that I was, um, I personally felt it was a little bit soggy. I was a bit soggy brained, and I needed to do something to sort of stimulate me a bit more than lying on the floor in a baby gym for a while. And you know, I looked around to see what there was out there, yeah. and. I knew I didn't want to go back to work full time. Um, and then I looked at um, the skills and the work experience I'd had and why couldn't I use that for the greater good sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so a job came, well, it's not a job, it's a position on a statutory board in within um, the Isle of Man Office of Fair Trading and applied for it. Yeah. And obviously because I'd recently been involved in trading standards in the uk um i think they saw the fit so oh, yeah yeah so i went along and it's different it's very different mm-hmm. i mean obviously trading standards is trading standards across the board but the actual remit of the office of fair trading is so much wider than trading standards was in the uk yeah sure um and for a small land with its own legislation as well which is quite different um so i went and worked with them and i have and i still am i'm coming up to the end of my second term um and I've been doing that and, and basically it's just a lay member role where we don't dictate policy procedure but we act as a critical friend and strategic direction yeah great uh, within the board it's good to hear yeah so yeah I started doing that and that was only sort of one meeting a month and quite a lot of preparation beforehand yes um and any sort of decisions that needed to be made in between time um did that and then I started sort of getting back well I, I sort of went into the we moved from Onken. We were living in an apartment in Onken. We moved to Laxey as a village, and I sort of felt like I wanted to get to know the village a bit. And yeah. I went, Charlotte was ill one day and didn't go to nursery. And we wandered down to a place, and it just had a board outside, and it said co- coffee and chat. And I walked in, and every head turned <laughs> as I walked in. I was like, oh, God, how's this? And then they went, come in, come in. Yeah. Do you want a cup of coffee? And sat down and that was it. And that's when I started to get to know people in the village. Yeah. It's sometimes taking that step, isn't it? Yeah. Get outside your comfort zone. No, it is. Yeah. It's a big thing. Yes. Um, so I did that and then uh, just sort of looked around for other things to do. Again, I, I looked and uh, there was a position on the parole committee. So I thought, well, I could use my experience of doing investigations and that sort of thing to look at evidence um and i did that for six and seven years gosh yeah so you, you're not on that board now i'm not no um basically the job i do now because i'm chief executive of live at home i started doing seven hours a week yeah um i just went into laxi to help to create to do the sort of groups that they had running there mm. and then i've gone from that to becoming chief executive of the the whole island the whole thing, thing. yeah because yeah. there's quite a few local schemes aren't there there's a- yeah so we cover everywhere in the island at the moment apart from the south um, okay. which is southern befriend is a very similar charity to ourselves who've right. been along for a long long time yeah the actual charity's been on the island for 22 years now live at home um and so we've got groups that run in um the east douglas west north and we've got northern men in sheds as well yes i saw so that we've, on uh, we've facebook got, yeah, yeah we've got a lot of stuff going on yes um so we've gone from uh, i've gone from sort of being very concentrated in the laxi area to sort of looking at the the wider schemes mm. and how it works so you get out and about quite a lot i don't anymore no right. um, i have to do the sort of the schmoozing a little bit in terms of <laughs> trying to develop policy and uh, yes. procedure and so i do go out occasionally i go and have lunches and or pop in and particularly if we have volunteer thank yous or inductions i always like to get to know our volunteers properly yeah um, but there's a lot of work we only get 13 percent of our finances that we need per year um from government we do okay. we do benefit from a grant from government but the rest of it we have to fundraise yeah, for. Sure. so um that tends to fall to me um, so it's going out and right. And how many how many people do you engage with? So we at the Accord? moment we've got about five hundred people on our books as yeah. members. Mm-hmm. Um, but that constantly fluctuates, and we've got about one hundred and fifty people that are volunteers, registered volunteers with us. That's um, great. People, all people can 
I think the benefit of working with us is that if you come to us as a volunteer, you can do as much or as little as you yeah. can do. Um, and the same with members. We we'll say to members, you know, if we, if we ring you every week and ask you to go to something and you don't want to go, just say no. If We won't get upset. We don't get upset. But we'll just keep ringing you until you tell us to stop. Yeah, go um, away. <laughs> just to get, yeah. And then obviously we've yeah. had the situation with COVID mm. where we really have come into our own yeah, in sure. terms of, you know, our aims and objectives. Yeah. Yes. So I guess you could almost be both a member and a volunteer if you felt, if you were, had been poorly for a while and then you recovered with, you know, maybe you want to give back something and get involved as a volunteer. Does that, does that happen Absolutely. often? Absolutely. A lot of people come to us thinking that they want to be volunteers and turn into members. Right. Um, it's a, a bit complex, but actually admitting that you're lonely in some way is quite a big thing to do. Uh, for a person and um, some people don't like to be helped so they yeah. like to feel that they're helping rather than being helped yeah sure I, I'm not a psychologist this is just what I found over the years yeah um, but you know I've had ladies come to me at 83 and say can I get involved can I be a volunteer and they're like yeah sure if you think that that's something you want to do come and help us and actually you find some volunteers get more out of the groups than they would have done if they were a member because mm. they get a different set of friends and sense of purpose maybe absolutely yeah, yeah. so it, it works both ways yeah, and sure. i don't mind what i call you as long as you're <laughs> enjoying yourself and you're getting some benefit out of us as a charity yeah, that's um, great. and you know it, it if it builds a group of friends that you've never had before and you've got people a lot of the groups that we've had have changed over the years and some of it has been f from a financial perspective because we have to make sure that we run cost neutral we're not a profit making business but we also can't sub subsidize constantly no, because it just means run money runs out of yeah. our, our um i guess you account. have to be quite pretty transparent and all that too very yeah very, yeah. yeah um and because you've got the word charity in your title mm. um people think that you have got reams of money and you can just yeah. do things for free no i think a lot of ch charities seem to shoot themselves in the foot by not being transparent but it is so easy to do so you know yeah. to say you know it's, look, a, di it's a difficult yeah. sort of it is a difficult balance. straddle really yeah, yeah. um so what i try to explain to people is that whenever we do stuff if it comes to a point where we are subsidizing at continually that's not a position we can carry on no. but sometimes the groups that we've maybe changed the group even though it might be smaller than it used to be, may carry on. And I just think that's a positive for yeah. us. Yeah. You know, if we've managed to get a group of people together and spend time together and then they want to continue that when things change, sure. that's fantastic. That's a result in my yeah. eyes. Um, but then we look, we're looking to try and cover the needs of as many people as we can do and um, give them what they want. And sure. also better for the region or the area. So it's... Um, yeah, it's constant change. What success stories have you got? Is there any you'd like to share with, with particular case studies that you might mention that somebody that's come along and... I think, I think, so COVID has been a massive thing for us because we had to flip from taking 30 to 40 groups out per month and 150 people going into people's houses and visiting them to stopping yeah overnight i mean we literally i took a decision on a friday and then the government here announced a lockdown on the monday um because the groups that we deal with are all over 60 and i know that the vulnerable group was deemed to be over 70 yeah, yeah. but um i just thought i didn't want to risk people's health by carrying on having mass gatherings while things were you know no decisions had been made and and nothing was um confirmed yeah so we went from that and it was sort of we had to look at well what do we do to make sure that people that we support normally don't become more vulnerable by the fact that covid's happened mm. um and so we turned mainly to telephone befriending so right um the people that were going out and doing the visits to people would take would carry on ringing that person to make sure they were okay and literally i spent our staff spent a week to two weeks ringing every single one of our 500 members and saying to them what support mechanism have you got what help have you got in terms of deliveries? Have you got access to the internet? Because so, many so much of the yeah. government stuff was on the internet. So much of the buying stuff was on the internet. And when we did a, a straw poll, 75% of our members didn't have access to data. That's, uh, so all those messages incredible. were going out. Mm. And a lot of the crucial people didn't know how to do stuff no. so what we did was we took over the roles of getting delivery company numbers we did um 
I mean, we ended up doing things where people's washing machines are broken. We sorted out getting a new washing machine or if they usually used a laundrette and went to it, then getting laundry deliveries. And there was all that sort of stuff that you don't really think about. And, you know, if people have got families and families were obviously stepping up to the plate and it was fantastic. There were volunteer groups everywhere helping out. That was amazing. Um, But for our core group, we had people with things like food allergies that couldn't take food deliveries because they didn't know whether they would be ill because of what they were receiving so we had volunteers go out and do specific shopping for people yeah um i didn't have loads of people going out because i did i didn't want to no you just exacerbate the problem more risks Yeah. yeah um so we just did that and then um as time went on we did activity packs we did board and busters we we worked with a couple of other charities who gave us jigsaws and books and dvds and we oh, took great. them out to people and dropped them at the driveway because they were still shielding when everybody else had started to come out the over 70s some of them because of their health conditions were still shielding up until the end of august yeah and um, so we've carried on doing that mm. we've just started doing our groups again and i had so many phone calls very early on as lift as the restrictions lifted saying when are we going out again because people were desperate yeah. that first meeting we had in douglas honestly your heart just soared when you heard everybody and they were all you know, chatting together and it was just i know it's, yeah, it's amazing it's totally different isn't it isn't it bizarre um, how we carry on and the rest of the world is still i know i know it yeah. we're so privileged we certainly are yeah i mean i've got so many friends still over in mm. the uk who are wearing masks and now having to go down to six people gathering and and we're still doing what we can do unimaginable yeah would you say you're pretty well prepared um if we had to go back to to lock some sort of lockdown i I I mean i think so i've i've sort of been a little bit cautious in terms of returning to the groups who are nowhere near running the group levels that we were because i am concerned that lockdown might happen again and we just end up having to close and flip again so we're continuing with the befriending for people that because there are still some people that don't want to go back out yeah understandably yeah um so we've still got that support mechanism there and i know that we've got that volunteer base now that will go back into doing the calls and they know because they've got to know that person i mean some people were didn't know each other from adam when they first started doing the telephone befriending but they've built over those 18 weeks yeah uh, they've built a a really good rapport between each other Mm -hmm. and i think afterwards a lot of them have started going out and seeing the people that they maybe spoke to over the phone yeah just to put a face to the name yeah sure but we've had um you know i mean there's so much that came out of the letters that i had back from people just saying what a difference we made and not that we necessarily did lots for them but they said it was more knowing you were there more Mm. knowing you were there to care and a and a friendly voice on the end of the phone not talking just about covid which everybody was doing where they understandably just talking about other stuff yeah so it's good Mm -hmm. no that, that is that is a great story but um prior to lockdown I guess the most, um, the surprising thing I think you, you relayed to me one time was that you think people, you know, that are surrounded, so say there's a, an elderly lady who's um, surrounded by her, fa- her younger family and yet feeling alone because her generation are no longer around and mm. the younger generation are great, but there's nothing like having somebody in your own peer group to 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 share and to to empathize with and uh. yeah i think that i mean so the 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 whole crux of us is you know we don't we're not judging people obviously because families are all fantastic and and a lot of families are busy i mean i know myself and my own mum and dad i was living here and they were in liverpool so we didn't get to see each other that much um so to have and in fact covid also brought this out there's if you've got a massive family support system it's fabulous a lot of family might pop around and have a cup of tea with you and go and take you shopping and do stuff like that sometimes there's nothing better than being able to sit and chat to somebody on a similar level to you who's not your own family sometimes you just need somebody different to talk to (laughs) and that definitely came out in covid i mean we had some families ringing us and saying look we're doing this and we're dropping stuff off but they could benefit by just having a chat with somebody different we've had instances with groups where we've taken people out for lunches i mean we before covid and we haven't done it yet but we started doing afternoon nightclubs yeah you um, said that because we've got a whole bunch of people that have got you know they're from the 60s so they like dancing and still want to get up and have a Mm. bit of a boogie um and we went to one of those and two of the ladies there they knew each other from school but they hadn't seen each other since they were 14 (laughs) 
and that was amazing. <laughs> and then they live on the Isle of Man, oh, which really? I mean, coming from Liverpool, you know, sometimes what are the well, I'm, I've become more. <laughs> I can't say I've become Manx, but I become more Manx now because I now do say, "Oh my goodness, I've got to drive all the way down to Crosby," <laughs> <laughs> or something like that from Laxey. Yes. So, um, yeah. but you know, the, the, the fact that they lived on an island all their yes. lives and they haven't seen each other since they were fourteen, sure. or well, even bumped into. I've got to say thank you for coming all the way to St John's. <laughs> yeah, I know it's mild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that's that's really great um so i mean you know if you if you don't mind me asking and i primarily ask people this when in my role as a financial planner mm-hmm. so what's your earliest memory of money okay so i've I, i've been talking to my 13 year old about this because i'm trying to do the same thing with her mm. so my mum and dad at 16 said to me that they would continue to support me with essentials but if there was anything I wanted extra like driving lessons because I was heading towards 17 and everybody else was talking about learning to drive that they would finance half of it but I'd have to match it so I was told to go out and get a Saturday job or do something to earn some money. And um, I, I really think, although I didn't think it was too fair at the time, I really think that gave me a good understanding of what things cost and what you have to do to earn the money to pay for things like that. Um, and I, you know, I went out and I got um, my first job was in Freeman Hardy and Willis, which was a shoe store yeah, in Liverpool. I remember it, yeah. And I worked there over Christmas and. I'm not a salesman and part of your sales targets was to sell polishes, shoe polish. Mm. So if you ever get asked when you go to a shop, you know, yeah, yeah that's that, why, that's yeah, why yeah. because <laughs> it was always what you were judged on. Yeah. Um, so I didn't, they didn't keep me on after Christmas. In, in banks, in, in banks, it was loans with insurance. <laughs> well, yeah, so, <laughs> Do you remember? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I sort of wasn't kept on after Christmas because I just hadn't sort of impressed them from a sales point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, then I went to work in British Home Stores again, doing like a temporary job. And I was on the tights, <laughs> sort of putting the tight display out. And then ultimately I got a job in Boots, the chemist, and um, worked there from about 16 to when I was just about to do my A-levels. And um, had the best time. I really, really enjoyed it, loved it. It was a really buzzy, big store in Liverpool. Yeah. Um, and a really good crowd of six, you know, people that were all six formers and Saturday girls and boys. Mm. And... Uh, yeah, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. But that paid for things like my driving lessons, half yeah. of it. Gosh. And I think, um, you know, I think probably if I hadn't have been able to get jobs and stuff, I think my mum and dad would have stepped up to the, you know, to the mark and helped. We were never sort of very well off, but we weren't also very badly off. So we did have things like holidays, but my dad had always done things like he bought a camper van so that when we had holidays, it was camping. Right. So we went all over England. So you have the history of camper vans. Then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we did France and places like that. Yeah. And then we developed. And then as he progressed in his job, we had to give the camper van up. And we cried when that camper van went home, went away. Oh, but it went yeah. to another family. Yeah. Um, and then we got a tent. And we lived in a tent. <laughs> we sort of did half tent holidays and half caravan holidays. Yeah. And then I think the first time I went abroad was 14 on a plane. Yeah. And the biggest thing I always remember about that holiday was you were allowed to smoke on the plane. Oh, yeah, I remember that. That was back. horrible, yeah. wasn't it? Oh. My mum and dad both smoked, so we had to sit at the back. Oh. Everybody smoking. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So, so my sort of, that's what I'm doing with my daughter now. Um, because I think, you know, when people have done okay in life and you want to have let your children have what you can afford to give them if you know what I mean and Mm. and my daughter does have some nice things but I also want her to understand that at some point she's going to have to stand on her own two feet and I'd like her to understand now that you know whatever she spends out it's coming out of a a block amount of money so I've got her one of these preloaded cards um, and I put money into that for her and that's for her non-essentials and that's how we worked excellent yeah now that's good good of all, of all the things you've done through your life so far, what then has given you most fulfilment from from a from a personal perspective and from a business one? I think every, it was a bit of a blank statement, but everything's given me a great deal of pleasure. I think this job gives me the most sort of satisfaction in terms of you can see the benefits of what we do. I think it's a very difficult charity to understand if you're not within it. 
um covid's made a difference i think people are starting to get it now because people understand what loneliness and isolation is about yeah so to see the difference in people and to receive letters to say this is the difference you've made to me is a massive thing but professionally wise my career path just i mean i had ambitions if i hadn't have decided to give everything up and, and change my life completely i would have wanted to become a chief executive of a local authority or something like that that was where i was headed mentally mm. but you know life changes and you've got to look at your balance of life and what you want in life haven't you so they're the decisions you try and make well said yeah thank yes. you <laughs> yes so for any aspiring or Existing business owner, entrepreneur, what would be your number one business tip in your organisation? I think the thing I've found with certainly working in the sector I work in now is totally different to where I used to work because I always had the cushion, particularly when I was in a management position, you had an HR department, you have a PR department, marketing department, you have somebody that does the wages. The job I do now, you have to do a bit of everything. Um, so I've never classed myself as a business person before because I've always felt local government, you're not really business. You're, you're using taxpayers' money or ratepayers' money to the best of your ability. You're not a business. You don't have to build profit or no. you don't have to grow your business. Um, charity sector, although it's charity sector, is like a business. Yeah. You have to make sure Quite competitive. you account for every yeah. penny. It's very yeah. competitive. But you have to account for every penny. Mm. You have to justify what your spend is on. Um, and you also have to look at what you spend is and are you spending it in the right areas. So I think it's, I think my biggest mantra is always look at the bottom line because I think if you don't do that and you haven't got a, a proper grasp of what your bottom line is money wise, everything else can just fall down within a yeah. seconds. Yeah. So I always, I mean, I'm not brilliant in terms of, I've never been an accounts person. I'm okay at maths. I used to run my own household I had a little book. I used to write down every single thing I spent and how much I had and what my actual, not just relying on bank, bank statements. So I, I know where my money is for the business. I know what I'm spending. I know what I've got to spend for the year. And I need to know that my bottom line covers all of that yeah. and I can carry on. So yeah. I don't know if that's good advice or not. Yeah. Pretty basic, really. Yes, yeah, budgeting, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Cash, cash flow at its, uh, yeah. its, at its best. Yeah. yeah. No, indeed. No, thank you. My, my next question, I normally ask people, what do you do to relax and keep your, keep your life in balance? But um, having read a little bit about you beforehand, you do quite a lot of things in your spare time. Do you still run that laxy paper? No, we don't do that anymore. No. There were three of us that ran it when yeah. we were all, we were all mums and the kids had just gone to school. Oh, excellent. And um, I was walking through the forest with a friend of mine with her dog. And I said, do you know what this village needs? We need a, a newsletter to yeah. say what's going on. And she's an ex-journalist. Okay. So she took over the right. writing. Yeah. Um, I set it up. We actually got some sponsorship for it for a year. Brilliant. Um, to cover the costs of printing it. Yeah. Um, and we offered it, we did it monthly. We did about, um, I think we did about 200, 300 copies. Yeah. We just used to leave it in the garage in the um, co-op and the news agent. Um, just telling people what was going on in the village and it was all things like um, we did do the flood back in when was that 2011 the, the first, first one the first when flood. the bus when the bus went the bus, into the bus, the the bus went into the bridge uh, off the bridge um oh, we did dear. that and when we yeah but the three of us have all changed jobs quite a lot so yeah, the girl okay. that was um doing the as the ex-journalist she's now just become just got an agent to write her own book Oh right! One of the wow. other girls is now an MLC. Okay. Yeah, Great. and um, I got I had to take on the role of chief exec for the charity, so the three of us just didn't have the time. No. And it sounds ridiculous, but it did take quite a bit of time because we'd have to go scratching for jobs and, no, no. and work. And <laughs> no, no, it's uh, it was a key one that we were talking about. Um, tips business tips we were having a having a bit of a joke in the office the other day and then business tips what would be your best business tips yeah don't commit to a weekly blog <laughs> yeah well it's even i mean doing things like social media i yeah. i went to the isle of man expo yes. and listened to a lady talk there and she said you don't realize how much time it takes to do social media work and i was like you're right it i does, have to block yeah. out a day yeah to put on but and that's why sometimes there's a big gap between yeah, and then there'll be a happen. flurry of yeah you know, we find it we spread it out you know the between the team, you are, team are great to to come up with yeah you, um odd article yeah it's yeah, good now that's good um so, so i did i did yeah. i did do that mm. um otherwise i've always been well i started playing golf a long time ago yeah i'm not particularly good why 
Why golf? I love it. <laughs> I do. It's probably one of the only sports I could say I was actually quite good at. I'm married to a golfer. Oh, are you? Oh. you don't understand it then. <laughs> I do understand. No, I don't understand it. I don't understand how hard can it be. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I uh, sadly lost my husband two years ago. Oh, dear. Well, nearly three. Yeah. Um, so I've had to find things to do to keep me yeah. men- mentally okay yeah so i've um actually gone down the route of exercising which again is very uh, alien to me it's very positive though from a i didn't realize how, how good it was for yeah. you actually i've always tampered you know tampered tinkered in, yeah. in the um sort of trying to keep fit side of things but um i i had a personal trainer and that's quite posh i know but um nah, he and brilliant. i just used to have three days a week where i'd get up in the morning and go and and we'd do silly voices and he'd make me exercise and run up hills and and he's been fantastic unfortunately he's just left and gone over to live in the uk so yeah. it's really sad but i've yeah. got a new lady and she's very nice oh, as that's well. good yeah i have a um, personal trainer i could they just it's wonderful to have that discipline isn't it yeah make you show up make you do things you wouldn't do that's the biggest thing is showing yeah. up because if yeah. i was left to my own devices i wouldn't do it no i wouldn't so um well it's done a, it's okay. a nice luxury um yeah. what i also did was um i've done i've been trying to do a little bit of alternative stuff so i've gone down the reiki route and that sort nice. of stuff and i can't really explain what it does for me and i don't understand it but it works yeah. it just gives, okay. gives me a chance that's e- like foot massage in a that's a um, reflexology yeah, reiki so is like chakras and healing and i don't know that what that no, is no. okay don't ask me to explain it i don't know but it makes you feel good so when andy was sort of andy had my husband had cancer um and at the end of his life, he was in hospice and they did offer him some alternative healing, yeah. um, the Reiki and that sort of stuff. And again, he said to me, well, if it just means I'm lying on a bed for 45 minutes, having a bit of a snooze, it's fine. And that's the way you could look at it. So yeah. if it works for you, I think, and it feels like you're doing you some good, yeah. then that's, go for it. Yeah, that's yeah. the way to go. So, oh, yeah, it's good. been a bit of a strange couple of years. Yeah, yeah. With I everything bet. else. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we're doing okay. Yeah, well done. Yeah, how's your daughter? Is she, she, she going through it well? Yeah. Yeah, she's doing okay. really well. I mean, unfortunately, just after he died, she started high school. Oh, that's hard. So that was massive. Um, yeah. But we've had Cruise, the bereavement charity. Yes. And they've been fantastic with her. They've been going and doing counselling with her when she needs it. Yeah. Um, the kids from Cruise, who've all had some sort of bereavement, meet up weekly. Gosh. Um, monthly, sorry. Yeah. Um, and then they've just had a weekend away at the Venture Centre where they all get together. And she said to me, you know, most of the time they can in normal life you don't come across people like that so it's nice to meet children who are in similar circumstances and you don't need to explain yourself to people about why you might be upset about something so it's about yeah well thank you for sharing that thank you (laughs) tell me about your golf golf's rubbish (laughs) i haven't played properly because um you weren't allowed to go on a a course were you the the ridiculous rules around golf (laughs) don't touch a flag (laughs) yeah no well it's not just that i haven't played for a while because job's just taken over my life yeah. in terms of you know time and at the weekends it's because Charlotte and I don't see each other that much because I'm working full time and she's schooling yeah. you try and spend a bit more time together yeah. at the weekend yeah. so four hours on a golf course as lovely as it is is half a day gone isn't it plus the driving there no, driving and back. a good walk ruined that's what Oscar Wilde said isn't it yes <laughs> he's a very clever man <laughs> very clever <laughs> oh dear Okay, tell me what you think are the best things about living in the Isle of Man. So I think there's a few things. I mean, obviously, I think in terms of comparing with where I used to live, and I did live for quite a long time, um, for me, it's the whole sort of safety. It's the feeling of um, life just being a bit more relaxed, a bit more chilled. Although I know people are all working hard and businesses and, um, you know, life's not, not simple over here. It's the fact that I can let my daughter just ride down to the beach and spend the day on the beach in the summer, people can leave the doors open. I mean, we, I was telling somebody the other day about in Liverpool how we used to have to take our radios out of the cars. You oh. have to slide them out with the, you know, or take the front panel off. Yeah. Because people used to break into your cars to get a Make radio and sell. Yeah. Um, it makes Liverpool sound really, really bad. It wasn't that bad, but you know, there were precautions, and I'm always still cautious about. I always make sure things are locked, and that's just always been instilled in me. But there is that feeling over here that you don't need to do that as much, although 
you know, times change and things, people should always be security aware. Mm. Um, and I just like that uh, whole just way of life. Yeah. I think it's just uh, totally COVID. different. Yeah. And, and even now, like we said before, you know, with COVID, um, looking at what everybody else is going through across and what we're what normality we're living in now mm. is just you know yeah. where else would you get that what would you say are the main challenges the Isle of Man faces societal one I guess coming coming up with um, increased public debt from the, the Covid payouts and things like that yeah that's um, it. I think it's got a lot of I mean working within um, an area of health and social care I think you know um, there's a big challenge going on particularly with the fact that the government have decided to go down the transformation route for health and social care um there's some really big decisions need to be made there because they've got to look at how things are running and how will things have to be run in the future and i think with the debt that's likely to be impacted from covid budgets everywhere are going to be very very tight um to run a service or uh, you know within budget is very difficult with health so it's a combination i guess of effort from first second and third sectors yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we've got an aging population, um, so the demands on things like health are going to increase. Uh, you've got to look at the youth now as well, encouraging people to come back when they go to university, to not stop that drain of brain and knowledge and experience leaving now in the in the middle parts of people's lives. So I think there's a ma- there's a massive challenge. You've got to make it appealing for people to stay. Um, and encourage people to come back yeah um and keep that level going because what you don't want to do is end up with you know a very unbalanced age spread yeah no that is a big challenge for us isn't it yeah. um i mean do you um do you see within the, the, the huge third sector we have it's so we're so fortunate to have so many mm-hmm. philanthropic people here mm-hmm. Do you think there's a, a bit of a danger of any silo activity going on? Or I mean, you heard, I heard you say about sharing some some good practice across resources in, in during COVID. Do you see do you see that you know collaboration more of a feature going forward? Um, I mean, I'd like to say that there is collaboration happening. I don't think there's probably as much as there should be. Um, I think through COVID there was a feeling of wanting to work more collaboratively. Yeah, know what you mean. Um, <laughs> Um, but I think it's going to be needed. I think, you know, there's so many charities out there that could end up in some sort of difficulties because of our whole fundraising abilities have been chopped. And I can't see at the moment that that's going to get back to normal anytime soon. Yeah. So, you know, if people have, when we go back to the bottom line, if your bottom line's been hemorrhaging because you pay staff, because, and again, and again, we go back to the whole definition of charity. A lot of people don't see that charity should employ people. But if I didn't have my team of staff doing the logistics of sorting out the stuff that we they do you couldn't expect a volunteer to do the level of work that they do it's just not feasible so if your money is coming out in staff wages uh, and you haven't got the ability to fundraise or there's no access to i mean i'm, I'm also questioning whether the cor- corporate support that we've had in the past has been fantastic i think that might be affected by covid because if people's budgets have been affected then you know you yeah. might not want to be following your csr uh, responsibilities because you can't afford to. No, that's you true. Know, the money's got to be used elsewhere. And I guess, is there increased governance um, responsibilities for charities now? There is because there's new legislation that's coming in April this year. It's yeah. not really that new. It's just probably putting things in place more formally yeah. that has been expected um, in the past. So people are going to be made to work more strictly within their memorandums and articles of association so if you say that's your purpose of your charity then that should be what you're doing your work around so the collaborative work might come more because there are two that have got different aspects that are coming in to do work that suits both if you see yeah what I mean. yeah you can see so, it make a lot of yeah. sense yeah so i don't it, it's, a, it's a very sort of strange time well everybody says strange times isn't it so oh, yeah. it'll be interesting to see what comes out no, as time no. goes on i know i don't hear below that there's there's actually a luncheon being prepared downstairs which for anybody outside of the isle of man is just bizarre they, mm, they can, yeah. yeah come and have yeah, yeah come and have it yeah it's nice yeah it is so what sol- solutions and opportunities could you see if you were say a government minister you know what's uh oh 
We don't have to be political. <laughs> you don't have to give an answer. I don't, I don't, like, to, I don't like to be political. <laughs> no, you don't I, have to I, be. No. I personally would not want to be a government minister because Me I think it, it must be one of the most horrendous jobs. Um, I mean, having worked in local government in the, in the UK, um, I never understood why people wanted to be a councillor because you were never off. And I think it's the same over here. You know, as a as a minister or an MHK, yeah. you, you know, you're never off. No, work, eighteen hour days. I think some of them are working. But it's not even that. It. When you're walking oh. down Strand Street, you can bump into somebody, and so yeah, I don't know. If you said to me, what what would you want from a government minister that was listening to you? I think I would like more appreciation for the work that the third sector is doing. Um, not that I don't think it is appreciated. That sounds like a, a bit strange what I've just said, but I think um, there's a lot of work goes out there with, by volunteers and by agencies that have got volunteer bases and that work is not recognised. And we all put information back into government, to ministers and to um, civil servants and say, right, this is the work that we're doing and this is the equivalence that we think it would cost you if you needed to take it over. And the thing I always think is... If somebody like Live at Home wasn't in existence, how would you do or oh, how impact. would you cover the work <laughs> that we do? If people didn't have that conduit to go out and enable them to feel um, important and relevant in society, the impact on people's physical and mental health would go downhill. Yeah. Undoubtedly, there's evidence, there's research that proves that. Yeah, government would have to pick up the and tab. they would then yeah. go into the se- yes, into the sector no, no. much earlier than they need to now. So, do you get an opportunity to feed into any of the government agencies through third sector? We do. Yeah. Yes, we've got um, CVO. I- I can never remember what it actually stands for, but it's a, it's a collaboration of voluntary organisations oh, okay. um, that get together and we talk about things. But sometimes it's knowing where to go. The yeah, difficulty no, is, no, is who, sure. do you go, who do you go and talk to? Well, I hadn't heard of it. So Yeah. No. Well, the CVO, just, we are a group of charities that yeah. all get together and we compare and talk about commonalities. That's interesting. And, uh, yeah. Did and we're feel... also part of the Chamber, the Chamber of Commerce. Yes. We've actually got a, a, cha- a charity Grace. sector. Yeah. So we, I, we're a member of that. But again, it's down to you as a charity as to what you get involved with. Oh, um, yeah. So we, we're in with everything because I think sharing information and knowledge is yeah. is a great way of learning. Yeah, that's very much a, a key uh, cornerstone of Karen Pegg's uh, manifesto. manifesto but she's yeah. just, just, just re- so I, I did get yeah. involved in the webinar about, you know, where the manifesto should go um, from a charity sector point of view. How well done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. But, I mean, I think you need to be there because if you want to be heard, you need to ha- you need to speak up. Don't yeah, you? you do. Yeah, um, and you know, you might feel that a lot of the time you're shouting and nobody's listening, but sometimes that one thing will get picked up on. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least it's it's coming from a you know an, an informed uh, source through 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 um, through this organisation. So, but uh, oh, good to hear. Let's hope they're listening. <laughs> <laughs> yes, fingers crossed. Well, what what have you got planned next? Um, so um covid i keep going back to covid it's been quite an interesting time for us there's no going well well it, okay it's, it's still, still exists, here yes, isn't I know, it, it is it, it's again, a... beauties of living on the island man yeah um covid has given us a chance to go back to our members and talk to them about things that we don't do at the moment that they might be interested in so um we did a questionnaire when we finished um, the telephone befriending side and started doing the groups again to look at our support and what people felt about it. And we asked people to rate us. Um, and we asked them a number of questions about going forward and would they be interested in going back in, out in groups? Would they feel comfortable? Would they want to wear masks? Just so that we knew what we needed to put in place. Yeah. But it was really interesting. Some of, I, I, I did a little report yesterday, which I've haven't got to go to our board but i've got some of the figures yeah over the 18 weeks um that we were doing some work for um during the covid lockdown proper lockdown period we made over 5200 calls out to people to check in and make sure that they were okay Mm. and when we came back to asking them um how we'd supported them we got very good results people 88 percent gave us a rating of eight or over in terms of the support we'd given them which i was really pleased with yeah um but we had uh asked them questions about digital going back to the whole issue i was shocked you know that that many people didn't have access to data um and i asked the question about you know did you get data during the time that you're in lockdown because people started wanting to do facetime whatsapp skyping family and friends so um i think we had 
60 of them, 60% of those that we responded to the second questionnaire said they didn't have access to digital. Out of those, I think 10% did actually get something. But then we said, well, out of the ones that didn't go and get digital means, would you now be interested in? And um, only 24% were interested, even yeah. after the COVID period. Gosh. We forget fast, though, don't we? Uh, that, I would but only I say that, but I don't know whether it's that or whether people are still scared it's of the fear. digital. I think yeah. it's the fear. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's an area that I'm going to be looking at. Going yeah, that's forward. great. Yeah, I'd be interested um, in hearing more about that. What we did also talk to them about was um, the di- the telephone befriending, and nearly fifty percent wanted us to carry on with that. Oh, um, yeah. and that's something that yeah. okay, it might happen with a one to one befriending relationship, but we yeah. don't naturally do it. No. So uh, again, vision wise that's where I'm going to start looking for yeah. it just gives me a proper idea of how we can develop as a charity for making sure that we're meeting what people want yeah feedback's very always valuable yeah yeah so I mean it was a really good learning curve for us you know it sort of has given us the evidence of everything that we thought where we benefited people and um I mean the biggest thing for me is the flagging system that our charity does because A lot of time with the people that we support, um, we see them more regularly than others. Um, So we sometimes see things like a deterioration in cognitive things. And we don't diagnose, obviously. But if we've got concerns, because with our initial assessment, we have an agreement with that person that if we've got any concerns, we can contact their next of kin or their friends and family. And so we can ring and say, look, we've seen this is happening with your dad. And have you thought about it? And a lot of the times it'll be yes. Mm. Um, And we have got that um, it's, it's a top tip actually isn't yeah. it and, a, and I think as yeah. well because we're not deemed to be health and social care people um, people will talk to us about things that they wouldn't talk to about with a social worker or mm. um, and you know um, the generation we deal with at the moment there's still a lot of people that are scared about social services or interventions or interference from outside yeah um, and because of the, char- the fact we're a charity they don't really recognize us as, as being threat is not the right word but you know a threat to their lives or their livelihood we're um just moving on to the sort of end of the kind of interview really but mm-hmm. there's always a few questions i like to just uh just to, just to find out a little bit, a couple of personal things but um any books you've read recently that you'd recommend to listeners as a source of inspiration self-development philosophy anything like that yeah i don't i've not really ever gone down the sort of self-development book route um i I read a lot of biographies um so i like to read about people's lives and maybe i pick up things from that can't say the they're not always the best in terms of business. I really went through a phase of really loving to read about the old film stars. So people like Grace Kelly yeah. and all that sort of stuff, you know, the old Hollywood stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think some of the biographies now, they're not as good as they used to be. It's like, you know, they write a biography when you're about 25, don't you? Yeah. Well, there it's be like, ghost written written a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't got a life. No. We haven't had a life yet. No. So um, I, I tend to, <laughs> I tend to read for just pure enjoyment, really. Yeah, um my favourite book out of life is um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, Roll Doll. Because that. it was the book that really got me into reading. Yeah. I mean, I'd read, I read a lot of Ina Blyton and, you know, I, I, my mum used to say I used to walk around with a book in my hand and any time I got a chance to sit and read, I would. Mm. Um, I don't read as much as I should really now. Um, no. And I did defect over to Kindles, which is probably... It's been a great thing because when you go on holiday, you only got one Kindle and not 65 books stuffed in your case that takes over most of the weight. Yeah. Um, but it's strange because sometimes I read a book and I can't even remember the title. But if you have an actual book in your hand, um, right. it makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I can't Good. really give any. Have, read, have you read Jurgen Klopp's one then? Has he, has he done one? No, yeah. no, no, did you? <laughs> you picked up on the Jurgen Klopp thing. <laughs> yeah, I think, who's he? Oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> no, I did, I did say that he is one of my current heroes. And it, yeah. it, it's partly because I'm a Liverpoolian um, and a Liverpool fan. But I do think his management techniques and his management style is something that I think a lot of people can learn from. Mm. Um, there was a program on channel four a little while ago about his, you know, how he works. And I just think, you know, he just oozes likability, doesn't he? Mm. And but gets the results. So if he yeah. can end up being like that, and he's quite nice, you know, he's not bad to look at. Yeah. On he's not eye candy. Yeah. <laughs> <A> bit of <laughs> eye candy. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, what's your favorite quote? Okay. So I've, I've put, 
down a couple, but one of my favourite quotes is um, a Spike Milligan one, which is, I told you I was ill. Yeah. But that's you spent a lot of them. Um, yeah. One of the things that's happened since my husband died, my daughter actually asked me about my favourite quote. Um, and she's actually had some tags made for me, which oh. I've got in my bag. Oh, lovely. And um, it's a luggage tag and it's a Stephen Hawking quote, yeah. which was split over two tags. So it says, it matters that you don't just give up. And the second bit was look at the stars, not at your feet. Yeah. I thought that was a really good. It is. That's lovely. Yeah. Quote. Yeah. That's lovely. Well, that's a really good place to kind end. of end, really, yeah. isn't it? No, thank you very much, Jackie. I mean, uh, where can people go to more to learn about you? At the start of, uh, start of today, you handed me a couple of new leaflets that you've had produced for the Isle of Man Live at Home schemes, which yes. um, which looks great. So um, those are available. Where are these for people? Well, we haven't really put them out anywhere. We okay. tend to... Brand we tend, new. Yeah, brand the new. press. We, don't, we, we are going to look to start putting them around doctor yeah. surgeries and places yeah, like that. Yeah, we can put some in, our, in the mill here, yeah. Um, yeah. in the, in the reception. Um, so generally as a charity we take referrals from absolutely anyone and anywhere so if you're interested and you want to know a bit more about us we have got a website Mm -hmm. it does need a bit of updating which is part of again my role um, and I'm rubbish at that sort of thing so I have got somebody now that's going to come and help me with it excellent but it's www.liveathome.im yeah Uh, we've got a Facebook page which is where a lot of people get information from Um, I've got Isle of Man Live at Home Schemes we've also got one for um, Men in Sheds Northern Facebook pages I have got an Instagram. Um, oh, do you again, know that at home. <laughs> no, I've tried to work that one out, um, and I've started a LinkedIn page as well. But I'm just developing that. Yes, I saw that. that. Yeah, yeah. So we're trying to put. I, I never know quite what to put on the LinkedIn because it's not as easy as a Facebook one. No, and it, you have to put more. I think you have to schedule more posts. Yeah. Um, I don't know anybody really who has a sponsored you know pays for it it's, no um, i've got again the lady that's going to help me with the website yeah. it's going to help me oh. guide me a bit more on that yeah. so we have gotten multiple ways but i would say probably facebook's the one that we update yeah. the most it tells people what events we've got coming up sure it talks about um some uh, things that are happening it shares information we often put things on yeah. like scams from the police you know if people haven't seen them on other sh- other pages we oh, try and good. share that sort of what, information the finan- financial, yeah, scams. financial scams well done great um, we try and spread yeah. that around as much as That's possible good. yeah but generally other- otherwise you can call us which is yeah. 616 571 and speak to us and right we'll take it from there 61 yeah got it Thanks, Jackie. Thank you it's very much. It's been great to, to learn all about you, and thanks for coming on and sharing all, all this uh, information for our listeners. It's really appreciated. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Island Influencers from Thornton Chartered Financial Planners. To find out more and for useful links, visit thorntonfs.com slash podcasts.